and good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, this is uh, Mishcon's digital session, uh, turning words into action. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just hand to our panelists uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, I'll start with our guest, Vanessa Cathy from Lockton. Over to you, Vanessa. I'm Vanessa and a vice president at Lockton Insurance Brokers, which is the largest privately owned insurance broker in the world. I'm Joe Hancock. I'm a partner at Michigan Rare, but I, I'm not a lawyer. I, I, I head up our cybersecurity practice. My name is Mark Tibbs. I'm the cyber intelligence director at Michigan. OK, so without further ado, um, let's move to our first, uh, our first question. Um, this is around cryptocurrencies. Do they create ransomware? That there's no doubt that being able to make anonymous or pseudo anonymous payments easily has helped cybercrime more broadly. Whether that's kind of created ransomware or not, I'm not sure. You know, ransomware to me comes from a, a combination of threat actors that have, you know, historically cyber criminals not been the most sophisticated, have stepped up in sophistication, a trickle down of capability from state sponsored actors to the cybercrime community for organizations having a higher awareness around the impact of a cyber attack and therefore being able to pay for it and the payment mechanisms themselves along a whole host of reasons. I think that it's clear that cryptocurrency has definitely facilitated ransomware attacks and allowed them to proliferate. The big advantage, as you've touched on, of course, Joe, is the anonymity factor. Uh, the tracing cryptocurrency is certainly far more complicated, for instance, than tracing a bank transfer. So the criminals are obviously far more likely to get away with it. I think if governments regulate to disrupt the flow of digital currencies, this may well reduce the number of ransomware attacks. But I also think it's fair to say that a determined criminal will always find a way to take advantage of cryptocurrency or not. Where do insurers fit into the response? The most critical point for the purposes of this discussion is that a typical standalone cyber policy will cover ransom payments. Uh, it will also extend to the costs associated with the ransomware, so including the costs of engaging specialist negotiators, for instance. They will also cover the first and third party costs relating to the data. So the first party costs are the victim's own costs in dealing with the breaches, plus the third party costs, so the liability for the insured in dealing with third party claims resulting from a data breach. I think one of the most essential benefits of where a cyber policy fits in and where the insurers fit in is the access to a breach response team. So this means 24-7 access to experts, including a legal team, IT forensics, crisis management, and uh, PR consultants. Joe, in a previous life, you, you were an underwriter. Uh, so you've seen both sides of the fence, haven't you? Um, what, are you what are your thoughts on this? I think insurers fit in before the response is triggered. Now, a, a good broker will be providing you value through the insurance buying process. So not just helping you understand kind of what you need to buy, but actually what risk you face, where best you can access services that can help you ahead of this being a problem, providing you good kind of risk management advice from their experience of, of what the market looks like, but also what else is happening out there you know so insurers kind of to me fit in alongside a cybersecurity team cybersecurity consultants or the, the wider kind of response what we're witnessing is, is certainly many insurers being uh wanting to take the discussion to before the event to get again organizations very much aware of the, the proactive measures they do need to be taking um, Mark, do you have any, any any thoughts, any additional comments? There's been a lot of press and probably um, sensational media headlines around, you know, the, the role of insurers in a negative way for in terms of ransomware. But I think there's been less focus on the role of insurers in a positive way because they do, in some senses, hold the key to making businesses up their standards. And I also think um, reading the Ransomware Task Force um, Framework Report um, there's some really innovative ideas for policymakers around how insurers can be more involved. I think there's some great novel ideas of the way that the insurance industry can actually positively impact the problem that's, um, that's been caused by ransomware rather than just being held up as a scapegoat. There may be some merit in encouraging businesses that are the victims of ransomware attacks to actually be more open with the details of, of the actual attack. Uh, such that there should not be any stigma in public, publicising an attack. And a rising tide of disclosure, rather than keeping the attack hidden, uh, will not only bring these things out of the shadows, but will also ensure that um, governments have overall data on these things. The need to share uh, sits at the heart of the solution to, to much of this. 
really that's what sits behind the executive order that, that uh, the White House put in place back in May, because really that is all about uh, opening up and really uh, getting to the heart of the problem with, with organizations, sharing more, doing more together. Uh, Mark, could I hand to you to uh, explain a little bit more your, your thoughts on this, please? Yeah, my understanding of it is that it um, applies to government contractors the federal, for the federal government. And I think overall it's a step in the right direction. It will raise standards. Um, it won't go far enough because um, it just addresses um, those contractors working with government and government entities in the US. The Biden executive order um, is, is going to have a slow impact and it will probably... Um, it will probably improve standards at a slow rate um, and it will probably be adopted uh, more widely, I would think. It's quite an aggressive set of timelines. There might be some you know, um, problems with overcoming those timelines and the red tape that it introduces might slow things down somewhat. Certainly, it's a very good initiative. It's the doing of it that, that uh, we really need to see some um, uh, progress and development on. I think that the executive order was rushed out as a policy argument to show that something was being done about this ransomware crisis and i think it isn't going to change a single thing we know that ransomware is a problem we know how ransomware threat actors carry out their operations we know the ttps that are being used we know the problems and we know that organizations still think that cyber is somebody else's problem or it won't happen to them and every initiative i see always has the core of it we should all share more. And it's one of those statements that you can't say the opposite of. And so everyone sticks it in there and applauds. And actually, it's to me, it's just rushed kind of policy making. If the Biden executive order had a budget associated with it for any organization to access, maybe that they matched the funding, maybe they said, you know, if you do any of these things, we'll provide guidance for you. That would have made a huge difference. But none of that's there. It's the federal government needs to get better at doing what it's doing already. You need to all share among yourselves. Not really going to say what that is, but, you know, please share more. And I want you to do it to really aggressive time scales. So everyone will comply with that order and nothing will change. So Vanessa, do you have any thoughts on this? The attacks on critical infrastructure are increasing. And obviously there's a need to be seen to be doing something to, to, to change that. You know, obviously the Biden administration guidelines only relate to the states. And of course, ransomware is not just isolated to the states. And it's important that these measures are replicated for the rest of the world. Is it immoral to pay ransomware operators? It's a bit of a blunt thing to say. It's a bit of a one-size-fits-all to just say it's immoral as a blanket statement. And I suppose people do take the, that view because it, you know, paying a ransom will obviously um, incentivize other ransomware gangs to, 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 to do the same sorts of things. In my view, there are drivers that mean that in specific circumstances, the only moral decision would be to actually make a payment. You have, you have to take, you know, protect your business, protect your customers, protect your employees, or even your country. The CEO of Colonial Pipeline, which is obviously and a, and a sort of a seminal kind of attack on, on, on infrastructure to some, to some extent. He said that. He said that, um, you know, he didn't take it lightly, but he took it to protect his country because there were so many other businesses in the economy that depended on uh, the pipeline. That, that, okay, they hadn't done everything perhaps they could have done to defend against it. But at that point, in that moment, they had no choice, I don't think. And I think it was the moral the moral thing to do was to try and protect their industry and protect the, uh, the critical national infrastructures, which would be aiming to be in a position where businesses don't have to pay. <laughs> that would be the best position to be in. Uh, so they don't have to make those difficult moral, moral choices. But um, yeah, that's, that's my view on it. There are many things we need to do to solve the cyber crime problem let's call it that not just a ransomware problem but to solve to solve extortion in its widest sense online and i think that one of those is going to involve stopping the payment of ransoms but that there will need to be a mechanism in place then to support at least the first victims of these crimes who then don't pay so whilst i i i kind of see this inevitable regulation coming and you're kind of seeing it through the u.s treasury sanctions yes. where that's the government saying we're not really sure we like these payments because we know they're going to criminal groups that it needs to stop at some point we're not quite sure how to stop it but you you can see how there's a direction of travel and i think that is part of the solution but there then does need to be a recognition that if you remove someone's ability to pay and therefore someone's ability to recover somebody else has to step into those shoes if it if it was going to be the case that payments are made illegal tomorrow 
there'd be so much pain borne out by so many people and so many countries that it just wouldn't be practical. Getting to that point would be great. And that's where we should all be aiming. But at the moment, that is just not, not, a, um, not viable. The FBI has recommended that non-payment of ransoms is the way to go. But really, you know, that, that's a rather simplistic approach. There are financial issues here, but there are also human safety issues often. Put this in context up here, there was the attacks, there were the attacks on the Irish health system last month and in, a, in the US on the Massachusetts hospital. And I think it's fair to say that when there's a ransom demand on a health provider, there's typically a positive response by the patients themselves to the payment of ransom. Uh, and I think perhaps as a general comment, ransom payments are, are potentially more negatively view, viewed by those not operating in the health sector. And so I think, you know, to pay or not to pay, it's obviously a very, uh, very difficult decision. My thoughts are, is that if a business can recover quickly, then perhaps not paying the demand is the best answer. But I do think that, that there should be some softening of pressure around whether or not to pay. Any other aspects of this before we move on? I think this year will be the tipping point for, for, for some of these attacks. Politicians will be forced into making political responses once you start attacking healthcare systems the, where there is uh, a victim that every, everyone can agree is is not a, a, a fair victim. Ransomware groups, I think, have just gone, uh, I feel like I'm supporting them now, but have gone a bit far. They're not being selective enough in what they're doing. They're, they really stretch their business model. And you, know, you might get a ransom from a hospital, but you, you know, you're not going to be able to do that forever because you're really going to really turn yourself into a real burning issue that people feel they need to deal with. I expect you're going to see, as we see, there's lots of elections coming up in the next few years, starting with you know, France not too far away, the UK a couple of years away. Actually, there will be some political statements around this and people will take a platform and say, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to do something about it. And you can see how that then ends up in a military response, which I don't think is they say the right answer, but where people get in there. So what are the pitfalls to some cyber insurance policies? I think two things immediately come to mind. Uh, the first involves consent provisions. Sometimes businesses that have cyber policies in place, they don't realise that when they've been the victim of a breach, they can't necessarily make all the incident response decisions entirely by themselves. They have to be mindful that when they're engaging service providers post breach, that they do engage with their insurers as part of the incident response process. And I think that's important to note. Uh, another pitfall, I think, is to be very clear on what you think you've actually bought or what you have actually bought. We know of businesses that have been caught out because they actually think they have a cyber policy when in fact what they actually have is a limited element of cyber cover under a more traditional policy. Uh, to put this a little bit into context, um, professional indemnity policies have cover for some cyber related issues. Jo, uh, given some of those, those potential areas for, for issues and problems, uh, what, what would you recommend? The fact that not all the decision making is your own anymore is definitely one to consider. The number of times I see incident response policies that don't reflect the fact that coverage is in place. I often see it, the insurer put into the same group as comms, PR, legal, data protection. Okay, a bit of an afterthought in there with everybody else. The most mature organisations we deal with, we see the insurer, um, all of the support that the insurer can provide being taken. Um, and also uh, and being therefore built into the plan as well i think one of the the pitfalls i see is you're at the mercy of the quality of the provider written into the policy there are some policies where the response you're going to get is not necessarily going to help you i say work with your insurer to select an instant response provider that's acceptable to both parties insurers are, are often agreeable to to you having someone else who's not in their panel written into the policy so because they the insurer knows that they that you will get a better response it will be more cost effective for them and you know and you're more likely to have a better kind of claims experience with them without further ado i'll, I'll uh, bring this session to a close may i first of all thank vanessa our guest speaker for joining the panel uh, lovely to have you with us today vanessa thank you for your input joe mark thank you again for your views and again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much.